Nisam Bolivinaka, Aloha, and specific greetings to you all as we join today's webinar in the ongoing Blue Pacific, Blue, uh, Pacific Blue Line webinar series. My name is James Bagwan. I uh, serve as the General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches, who is part of the deep sea minders that make up the Pacific Blue Line Collective. The topic for today's Talanoa or Tok Tok is Pacific guardianship, the role of indigenous systems and governances. By way of introduction, indigenous peoples and communities represent just under 5% of the world's population, yet are stewards of approximately 25% of the world's land surface and large ocean areas, which represents about 80% of our global biodiversity. Considered science itself, indigenous knowledge systems, ways of knowing and being, and its governance for thousands of years demonstrates how it has coexisted within the natural world. But indigenous sciences were dismissed and have been ridiculed by Eurocentric worldviews, excluded from the development discourse to the de detriment of ecosystems, communities, and the planet herself. The current climate crisis, however, and the declining state of our planet has caused the recognition of the significance of the guardianship role that indigenous people and communities play. Indigenous knowledge systems are now gaining the acknowledgement deserved by Western science, academia, and policy makers. Yet despite this acknowledgement, Indigenous peoples continued to be forcefully and systematically displaced from their ancestral lands and have their ways of life undermined through ongoing forms of colonization. At present, large scale development projects result in land grabbing, natural resource extraction such as mining, deforestation and pollution, which threatens the very existence of Indigenous peoples. And all the while, the climate crises wreaks havoc on indigenous territories and people's futures. As guardians, indigenous people continue to resist the threats of social, political, economic, and environmental challenges. This webinar draws on a millennia of knowledge systems, our custom practices, experiences, and beliefs as Pacific people to respond to global issues in offering worldviews and solutions to current day existential crises. Our panelists today demonstrate this indigenous guardianship of which I have spoken. And they are Kealoha Piscota, a Hawaiian traditional knowledge keeper and cultural practitioner. She has been a key frontline activist on issues ranging from Mauna Kea to the ocean realms. She oversees two advocacy organizations, uh, Mauna Kea Anaina Ho and Kai Paloa. Kealoa has been part of state, federal, and international consultations regarding human rights, environmental protections, and native Hawaiian burials and cultural customs. She has submitted interventions before the UN nations uh, councils and commissions on behalf of native Hawaiian civil and human rights, including Hawaiian rights to self-determination. She also presented to the UN Human Rights Commission and participated in the drafting of international legal standards for the UN's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Our next panelist is Colin Philp. Colin is a familiar name associated with traditional voyaging around our Pacific region. Colin is from Fiji and the co-founder and trustee of the Utonialo Trust, Fiji Surfing Association, and Fiji Outrigger Association. He's also president of the Sustainable Sea Transport Initiative, among many other sustainable uh, practice uh, communities and organizations. Colin has managed Lelevere Island Resort since 2012. He represented Fiji in yachting and outrigger paddling at seven South Pacific Games and six World Championships. 
He's a father of five and grandfather to Kale, Layla, Haley, and Adonis, who are his motivation to leaving behind a better planet. Our final panelist, Hildalini, a chief in the Taranga nation of Pentecost Island in Vanuatu. In 1987, she became the first woman elected into the Vanuatu parliament and served for three terms. Hilda worked alongside her brother, the late father, Walter Lini, in the liberation movement and served in the country's first parliament from 1987 until 1998. Her brother, Father Walter Lini, was one of the founders of Vanuatu and the first prime minister of the country after it achieved independence from Britain and France in 1980. Hilda has been instrumental in the nuclear free Pacific movement, women's rights, indigenous rights, and environmental issues. And so we say welcome to Hilda, Kealoha, and Colin. Our format for today will begin with each panelist responding to a guiding question, and then we will open the floor for a Talanoa based on questions from our audience. Finally, each panelist will have an opportunity for a concluding statement as we wrap up today's webinar. Our first panelist to speak today is Colin Phil. Colin, it's wonderful to have you with us. And it's a journey through traditional voyaging that you continue to advocate for healthy oceans, the environment for sustainable tourism. And I'd like to ask you to share with us your journey on traditional voyaging and what it led to the global recognition for sustainable sea transport. Thank you. Bulavinaka Padre and Bulavinaka viewers and uh, fellow panelists. Um, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share uh, my journey with uh, traditional voyaging and sustainable sea transport. The, the settlement of the Pacific is the greatest story of human migration and a story that all Pacific Islanders should be very proud of. Our ancestors were the bravest and wisest explorers that ever lived crossing an ocean that covers a third of the Earth's surface, an ocean that today provides 70% of the global fish catch. They were the very first deep sea sailors and navigators, thousands of years before any other explorers left the site of land. Our ancestors were venturing out across unknown seas to settle the islands we now call home. All of this could not have been achieved without traditional knowledge. This was an indigenous knowledge-based system passed down through generations and developed to enable our ancestors to live in total equilibrium with nature. This sense of deep respect, love and understanding of the earth, the wind, the ocean and the sky were deeply ingrained into the culture that we have inherited today. So as, as ancestors of the greatest navigators that ever lived, our challenges in the last century have always been about navigating change and adaptation to the world we live in now. With the challenges of climate change and modern development of our island nations, we need to breed a new line of navigators that can lead us into the future. I've been fortunate enough to be part of a very, a very small part, actually in a, in a huge resurgence of traditional voyaging around the Pacific a resurgence that started in Hawaii with the building of the Hokulea and its now famous maiden voyage to Tahiti in 1976. Aotearoa and the Cook Islands followed soon after and not wanting to be left out, uh, Fiji formed its own voyaging society in 2009, which is now called the Utunialo Trust. Pacific wide, the voyaging revival has been about perpetuating the traditional knowledge and skills of our ancestors. These skills were once considered extremely taboo and therefore was only passed down through the same bloodlines. So a navigator passed to his son and onto the next line, and so forth. This is the reason much of, our, of this knowledge was lost throughout the Pacific until a Micronesian navigator by the name of Papa Mao Pialag from the island of Satawal made it his lifelong quest to share this knowledge widely. The Utanyala has been very fortunate to have great navigators from around the Pacific stand on her deck and share knowledge with our crew. 
And I'd like to remember some of these navigators, such as Jacko Thatcher and Hotoroa Kerr from Aotearoa, Tua Pittman and Pia Patai from the Cook Islands, the late Chad Kalepa, Bayaburn, and Bruce Blankenfield from Hawaii. And for me personally, Hawaiian navigator Nainoa Thompson, who led that circumnavigation of the world on Hook Lea, has been an, a huge influence on my life. The traditional navigation skills we hold on to dearly in Fiji today can be directly traced back to Papa Mao's unselfish vision of the late 70s. Much of what I continue to do today is to assist in perpetuating Papa Mao's knowledge. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, sustainable sea transport. For centuries, our island nations have adopted Western options for passenger and cargo sea transport. Uh, our governments have always looked abroad for solutions to our sea transport needs. We import old vessels that are way past their use by date and no longer considered safe in their own countries of origin. Vessels that are so fossil fuel dependent that a large percentage of our annual fuel imports are dedicated to running these gas guzzlers. I think we have to ask ourselves in the Pacific some very important questions. Have we forgotten who we are? Are we not direct descendants of the best sailors and navigators that ever lived? Why aren't we seeking our own specific solutions to our tra sea transport needs? And surely we have the answers in the Pacific and we don't need any more internationally recognized consultants to show us how it should be done. And lastly, why should we accept foreign aid that is tied to a return predetermined outcome. I am part of a small group of uh, like-minded people that recently got together to form the Sustainable Sea Transport Initiative in Fiji. We are a nonprofit working to completely revolutionize sea transport in the Pacific. We are currently working on a pilot project in Fiji that will, will include the use of sail and electric powered vessels. But more importantly, we intend to offer solutions to outer island communities that is based largely on traditional knowledge and integrated and weaved into modern technological systems. Naka, uh, thank you, uh, Colin, for those uh, introductory remarks. And I think setting the scene for us in terms of the importance of recognizing, celebrating, and maintaining the immense responsibility that has been given to Pacific Islanders in terms of guardianship and bringing that knowledge and uh, uh, wisdom through the centuries into the world today. So I really appreciate that. Our second panelist for today is uh, Ke Aloha. And uh, Ke Aloha is is joining us from Hawaii, where it is still Thursday. So uh, it's, it's interesting that our, we are talking about past and present and future, and we are actually in that in terms of time zones. But what is time for us? Kealoha, you've been at the forefront of efforts to protect Mauna Kea, protecting what is sacred. And I would like to invite you to share with us your experiences or stories about the significance of Mauna Kea, because for many outsiders, this is about a mountain, a sacred science, site that is and a clash with science, but it signifies so much more for than that for the Kanaka Maoli understanding of dominion, their role as guardians, the challenges of indigenous worldview and our relationship with land, ocean and sky. And as I mentioned, the transition between time and space. So what lessons does the Mauna Kea experience offer for other movements that are seeking to protect the deep ocean from exploitation, particularly in our current situation uh, with deep sea mining? Oh, mahalo. Um, aloha, everybody. I'm really honored. Thank you um, for asking me to join. Um, I'm yeah, I'm just honored um, to be here. And so, yes, I wanna address your question. I think the way, best way to describe and speak about Mauna Kea first is 
our origins, our origin stories, um, uh, our chant of creation. Um, that's where Malnike is where our chant of creation helps to unfold. We have not only um, a point of creation in the highest heavens, we also have one in the deepest ocean. So these are what we call the pole, the highest heaven, the darkest, deepest space um, is where creation continues as well as in, in the very bottom, deepest part of the ocean. And also uh, if any of you are familiar with Hawaii and the uh, Papahanaumokuakea National Marine what they call National Marine Monument, but our Northwest Hawaiian Islands that go all, you know, all the way down um, in the north. These places represent not only our origin and where we believe our people came from, but also they hold all of our biodiversity. And, and therefore they are sacred, sacred because of their relationship to the heavens and, and, and our ocean uh, deities, and, um, but also our, our, our just overall connection and their every species on Mauna Kea is rare, threatened and or in danger. So these are the places where they sought to get, collect medicine, water, all of these things are connected to that mountain. Um, so I think I would start there. And in, in the chant of creation, you know, it's, it, it, it's important the way we, how we view the world is how we're going to treat the world, right? And that's the importance of bringing that indigenous knowledge back into, into our modern time. You know, in our struggle, uh, we didn't frame it this way, but it was framed in media and by the opposition that it was, Hawaiians against science. Of, of course, it's not Hawaiians against science. Our traditional knowledge is science. Science, really, it meets all of the criteria of science, and that it's measurable, it's repeatable, so on and so forth. I mean, our voyagers, as Colin was saying, um, demonstrate that. And it wasn't, it's been done millennia before anyone in the West even thought of it. And um, so our movement was not only for our liberation as a people, um, but standing up um, in peace in Kapu Aloha. That was another takeaway from this movement. Um, and it was our version of joining in with the global movements that were happening you know, from Standing Rock and uh, Black Lives Matter and, and all of these things. It's, it's, it's our native way of, of standing up and joining the global movement regarding everything from climate change to um, racism and colonization. You know, um, what we needed to do, because if you look at astronomy, it, 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 you know, we basically support astronomy in general, but we could never support it at the expense of all of these other things, including our decreation. You know, people need to understand that when we're destroying the earth or all of our sources, see, we don't, we're, we tried to change the paradigm here by saying, Mauna Kea is not a resource for our water, it's a source for our water. So it's not just resources that everybody's looking at, resources assume exploitation. So what we're trying to do is flip that paradigm and say, no, these are sources of our life. Our, our Moana Nui, our Pacific, our, our, is our life. And quite frankly, it's, it's a huge element that needs to be uh, kind of unified and, and collectively protected, you know? Because one of the, the views is that um, because the ocean is free, it's exploitable. You know, that the ocean is, um, how would you say, um, that it's, it's, it's uh, controlled by no one, right? Especially in the deep ocean, right? Near shore, we have some regulation, but out in the high seas, no more. 
but I think it's the reverse. Because the ocean belongs to everyone, it must be managed for everyone also. So um, that would be my starting points. Uh, and that's why I'm so honored to join here because I really do believe um, in, we need to not only stop extraction, but change the mindset around going back to our sources, you know, rather than resources, the exploitation. The exploitation in Hawaii is, is goes anywhere from the prospect of the ocean mining to just destruction and, re and forcible relocation of our people from our land, you know, and we have the long liners and the uh, Navy sonar and, and um, aquarium fish. It goes all the way, all the way across. But once we start turning that around and going back to the source and going back to participating in not only restoring uh, stopping extraction, but restore, seeking to restore abundance. I think because our oceans and, and our world needs, we need, needs to be more than just surviving. It needs to be thriving and restore, restoration of abundance. So anyways, once again, I'm so happy to be here and um, I'm honored and thank you for this opportunity. Did I answer your question? Oh, definitely. Mahalo, <laughs> mahalo, mahalo, ke aloha. Yes, uh, I, I, I think the, you, you know, that, that key issue about the, the need to shift from thinking about resource to source mm -hmm. um, and, and the challenge that we, we as Pacific people need to stop thinking just about our survival, but to stand firm for the flourishing yeah. of, uh, of all that we are a part of, uh, the land, the sea and, and, and the sky. So thank you very much for uh, for your, uh, your your introduction uh, intervention, um, Hilda. Uh, you have been formidable in your role in the formation of an independent modern state of uh, Vanuatu. A significant part of that uh, state was, or that struggle was, about taking back control of land in Vanuatu. And I, I would like to ask you to share the significance of land, what land means for the people of Vanuatu, and why is that the foundation of, of the Melanesian systems of ways and of being? You've gone from being a, a civil and political leader in a Western system of democracy and governance in your country to assuming your traditional leadership as a chief of Turanga, the Turanga nation. Um, you know, uh, perhaps you could also include there the, the, the experiences of how you navigate these two worldviews and the role of customs governance in providing solutions in today's um, Vanuatu and Melanesia. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tomai, James, Tomai, Kealoha, Tomai, Colin, Tomai, Choi, and Tomai, everyone who is listening. I acknowledge the indigenous keepers of the ocean continent, which was once called by Father John Doom. He called it ocean continent. And that's to remind us of where we come from and uh, the responsibility that we have to the ocean continent. Thank you for the question. Land was uh, the main uh, issue that we it is as well as we know it and land that is in the water or the seabed or land that is the ocean floor, uh, everything around us is based on land. And uh, when uh, the British and French uh, were subdividing the land and uh, giving it away, uh, we had the biggest uh, demonstration here to stop them from subdividing. 
and uh, land became uh, the main uh, issue in the constitution of the Republic of Vanuatu when we drew up the constitution. Here in Vanuatu, Article 74, 73 and 74 of our constitution states that all land in Vanuatu belongs to indigenous owners. And the rules of 74 says the rules of custom forms the basis of ownership. This means that every, everything on the land, in the land, on the seabed and the ocean floor belong, belongs to indigenous owners according to creation law and custom law. Now, what is the situation today? To discuss the, this, we need to understand the life of indigenous communities and their status at the time of oppressive coloni colonization and Christianization, Christianization, the status of indigenous people in what is known as modern civilization and the status of indigenous people today. I want to tell you about uh, an indigenous community because it is, it's still living as it is today where most of us come from Christian villages and communities. There are, I come from an island where there exist two original indigenous communities. They believe in universal creator, they observe creation law, they live with natural environment and are keepers of their language and culture. The young learn to speak their mother tongue from their mothers. Women live in dwelling, in family dwellings and are responsible for transferring knowledge to girls and young women. Men live together in a men's house and are responsible for transferring knowledge to boys and young men. They are prepared, they, they are prepared for, for the role that they're going to play as they get older. They learn about caring, sharing, peace, respect, and discipline from their parents and those around them. They, they also learn to grow their food, to hunt, to fish, to make household goods, and to exchange food and goods at ceremonies. They also learn, learn the solar and the lunar system because this guides them in their everyday life. They learn about life from their environment. Each year, they spend one month in the forest and surviving on fruits, nuts, and berries. They don't eat any cooked food. Women, men, and children learn to care about plants and land and are responsible for the protection of forests. Their identity is linked to their totem, the land, and reincarnation. Everyone is regarded with the same values and principles. Elders de deserve more, more respect because of seniority, knowledge, and wisdom that they possess. There are scientists, wise men, women who read what is happening and predict what is to come. They have the knowledge of seeing what causes the sick, what are the remedies, or how to remove these diseases. 
there are protocols of passing on the knowledge. When knowledge is not passed, elders pass away with very important knowledge and information. They believe that they are the living generation and keepers of culture, of cultural knowledge that has been passed on by their ancestors. This is the life and the strength of indigenous, indigenous people's solidarity. With indigenous governance, original indigenous, indigenous system and the governance is believed to coexist with the natural world and the natural culture. There are two main indigenous laws that are governed by indigenous governance. Universal creation law, which is the natural law, and custom law. The universal creator is the guardian of the universe and the universe. They are interconnected. Natural law of creation, natural law or creation law is the most important law observed by all biological species. Elders in original indigenous communities observed this. Next is custom law, which must be linked to creation law. The guardian for custom law is an institution of elders and is governed by indigenous governance. Long way, which is the indigenous community, indigenous people believe that everything in the universe is there because they play an important interconnected role in the natural world. They believe in the universal creator. No. They believe in the universal uh, creator as the guardian of the universe and the universal law of creation that regulates the natural governance, the natural role of planet Earth, the natural law, uh, role of the ecosystems, the natural role of the entire environment, natural role of bio biological species, and it, and it also natural, uh, regulates the natural role of human species, but most importantly, natural role of the spiritual beings that coexist with human beings. The role of natural, natural governance is to follow natural direction. Elders read, interpret, and inform according to natural law or creation law. Everything happens in the right or positive direction. The only negative happenings are natural disasters and they happen for a reason. For example, when there is no respect to the natural function of governance that regulate planet Earth, the ecosystems, the land, the environment, the human species, and especially the destruction of sacred places and their spirituality, then we find there is damage to the ozone, ozone layer and climate warming is now affecting climate change all over the world. Today, indigenous practices and systems are used to determine who we are and our resistance to modern law and order. Resistance to alien definition of land laws and foreign definitions to allow land occupation by foreigners, contrary to constitution, to the constitution in Vanuatu. I believe that a belief system has to be right at the beginning. Most people now live by the Bible and the modern laws. We need to fight for our identity, our language, 
our culture and our land. To defend our future for the sake of our future generation. Thank you. Tabeana. Thank you, uh, Hilda, for, uh, for your sharing this afternoon and uh, some very important issues that you have reminded us of is uh, that, that interconnectedness of land, sea and sky, and that we're all part of it. Um, I, I really appreciated the sharing from the learning of the experience of the development of statehood in, uh, in Vanuatu and and the, the, the question around land not being the property of the state, but belonging to indigenous communities. And you mentioned and highlighted also the significance of transferring and sharing, inculcating that indigenous knowledge, indigenous wisdom, custom law, natural law. Um, and you know the, the challenge around ensuring, I guess, from Vanuatu and looking at the rest of our region, that these things that are incul inculcated are not just uh, rhetoric that we talk about, but that they're lived and practiced. And you shared those examples and the inclusion of our indigenous spirituality, what in the Western world uh, should be understood as metaphysics, the, the physical and the beyond physical experience and recognition that indigenous communities have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tumas, for, uh, for, that, uh, for that intervention. We already have some uh, questions from our, um, our audience, both uh, who are watching uh, in the webinar and, and online. And so um, uh, a first uh, set of questions, uh, and this is for, for all panelists, so you can each uh, have an opportunity for, uh, to respond if you, if you like. Um, the question from Kalpana to all of the panelists is really around uh, indigenous specific traditional governance in terms of um, enhancing and supporting good governance and protection of resources in our region. And she asks, are there existing indigenous governance proverbs, laws and practices that are related to good governance practices in the, in the I guess, in the Western context, which can bridge that gap between um, um, Western contemporary concepts of good governance? And how do we give that narrative? How do we take that indigenous specific narrative um, of good governance um, to our, uh, our Western uh, understanding and vice versa? How, how do we manage that interaction to ensure um, good governance uh, practices? So who would like to answer that? It's interesting when everybody disappears. Maybe Hilda, um, as we're talking about good governance practices from the indigenous perspective and good how that translates into the Western style of governance that we see, particularly from a state perspective. Thank you, uh, James. Um, the indigenous governance system in an indigenous community only talks about a limited area. And for me, there, there is practice of the uh, good governance according to the area and the people concerned. When it comes to the Western concept and trying to merge together the two, I have been working in the area for over 10 years and it is a struggle. It is a struggle because the Western governance system does not uh, uh, re recognize that there are good elements in the uh, indigenous uh, governance system that should be married with the, um, with the Western governance system. So uh, I'm still working we're working in the, uh, on it, but it is a struggle. Thank you, thank you, Hilda. Kea Loha, you 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 touched on on one of the challenges of this as well in your in your intervention, where you you talked about how in these 
imposed, I guess, um, uh, governance systems and practices. There are these boundaries that from our indigenous perspectives do not exist. Um, uh, you know, and then you, you, you suggested this flip. What, is your, what are your thoughts on this, on this issue? I would agree with, you know, Hilda um, as well, that it's very difficult. It's like living a split mind, right? Because we have to know American law. In our case, it's American law, right? Um, because we were that other part of the divide from Britain and France and, you know, division of the entire Pacific. And I think um, one of the things that we've, many of my people, we've had conversations about how do we, you know, just because they divided it doesn't mean we're divided. So we need to go back and, and reconnect with our brothers and sisters of Moana Nui, the whole Moana Nui, because we should not be divided at all. We should be unified. But it, so let me get back to the question. It, it's, um, I, I believe that having the strong uh, cultural um, base, uh, indigenous base, spiritual base, um, when we stay in that realm, as we look at the landscape and even the political oppression and how it's coming at you, like for example, on Mauna Kea, we faced off using our own cultural value of aloha. In other words, you're not going to, you're, you're pointing a gun at us, but we, but we are not going to um, uh, stand down, but we will stand in aloha. And, and I think those, those values are that give us the, the strength of not only our ancestors, but the deity, the Akua um, creator to, to continue to move these things forward, even through the bumpy roads of having the West um, kind of uh, sitting on top of you. You know, um, we're trying to break through that. But it's, it's hard. It, it, sometimes uh, we feel very kicked to the curb in triage mode, not able to um, even take care of oneself, you know, um, and, and, and or your family or, or all, for all of those reasons. But I do think, uh, like in looking in the ocean question, right, um, we need to even utilize some Western law to help ancient law, like Roman law, public trust doctrine, right? Which basically holds that no one entity can dominate or control the extraction of one thing because it belongs to everyone. But we need to start articulating that out, out, out there in the world saying, listen, the ocean must be managed on behalf of everyone. Even, even in because codified in Hawaii law is what is known as the public trust doctrine, along with the precautionary principle, which, you know, I see that a lot being brought forward. But in the public trust doctrine, what we're trying to do is get, get the recognition that public trust doctrine bars any exclusivity or can challenge exclusivity based upon the fact that the ocean belongs to us to everyone. And so if they negatively affect one thing, it means they're going to negatively affect all of our ability to uh, use and enjoy uh, the ocean as it's supposed to be. In other words, even to grow the ocean, grow the abundance of it. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough no matter what. But I think, I think actually Indigenous people are rising up in that way, and they're they're moving that dialogue, um, even for the those who are mostly in the West. I mean, they they are learning it from our our opposition and resistance to it as well. That's what I would say. Yeah, thank you. Mahalo, thank you. the The challenge that we have to place to them to um, not only see things from their perspective, but to recognize our stance. Um, as you said, you know, the response, standing strong, standing in opposition, but standing through aloha 
as one practice to be recognized from the other side. There, there are some obvious gaps from, I guess, in, in many situations, uh, which is ensuring that our people have a well-versed uh, with all the other things that are being shed and information that they receive, particularly our children, um, there are some gaps that that perhaps is there in terms of the education or re-education. Um, Colin, in, 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 in your work in, uh, in not only sustainable sea transport, but uh, sustainable tourism, uh, this, this challenge of being able to translate traditional practice, traditional knowledge and wisdom uh, and good governance into a Western sense, I guess, with legislation and other things. What's what's been the challenge for you in that? I think uh, you know, speaking from Fiji's point of view, we've inherited a, an education system from our colonial masters, and firstly, we don't recognize who we are and where we came from. Um, and you know everything I talked about about traditional navigation is not recognized in our school curriculum. So you know as navigators, if you're if you're trying to navigate somewhere, you first need to know where you're coming from. And you know it's very practical in a very practical sense. If you're heading out to sea towards a, an island beyond the horizon, uh, you always want to know with the safety of, of home so you can return there. So, you know, in that context, I think uh, we first need to understand who we are if we want to know where we want to go in the future. Naka. Naka Colin, thank you to our panelists, to the, to the response to that, um, that series of questions from Kalpana. Um, very challenging, particularly for us, if we don't know our, or don't celebrate and recognize that indigenous knowledge and wisdom within our country, within our communities. How can we bring that um, in, into um, another style or another form of, of governance? I'd like to thank all of those who are putting questions um, into the Q&A and, and uh, making responses. Um, I have a question from, um, from Pefi Kingi, uh, and the question really is around intellectual properties, uh, the regional, national, local, tribal, familial need to ensure rightful stewardship, ownership, to ensure indigenous protection and sustainabilities. Uh, Kingi reflects on the complexities regarding customary ownership is that some of our Pacific people have taken on or assumed what she calls the palangi or haole interpretation in the governance practice. So the question that she's asking is, how do we ensure authentic collective or individual intent that is for the good of the people? And I would add not just the people, but the land and the sea and, and the sky, that holistic understanding. So how do we ensure that uh, authentic voice, that authentic intent. Maybe Kea Aloha? Sorry. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> I wasn't fast enough. That's okay. um, yeah, I'm trying to, I have to think about that. I think, I think, there's re different reasons for people to come from different perspectives. Um, you know, part of the definition of colonization is that we are not able to freely choose um, our political systems, our cultural systems, or, you know, we don't have self-determination. So I think um, part of the work that everyone has to do is decolonize our mind and also decolonize our ways. And, and the, traditional, the traditional ways are very important because m m people don't know where to fall back on. So when they're seeing, um, seeing traditional and cultural practitioners to go back to, to actually go back to go forward, right? To go back to our ways of knowing and being and living 
um, more are able to come on board. But we're in this crossroad, you know, where people still have to uh, pay their rent. They still have to, they still want to go and get a Western education so that they can follow up, you know, as, but, but, but I think collectively as we build, um, as Colin said, going back to our roots to know where and find out who we are so we can know where to go. Uh, I really uh, appreciate that because that is what we're all doing. And, and like I said, you're, you're, you're having to juggle too, but we can do it. We can, <laughs> you know, and we just need to, and, and not be afraid to, um, you know, show our vulnerability when we have it, but also to come from positions of power on things we do know. We do know how to restore abundance to our oceans. You know, we do, and, and we can do it. But there again, there's these blocks of government saying, well, Hawaiians, no, you don't get to do that. You know, we have very similar laws where all of the land in Hawaii is held in trust for the betterment of the condition of native Hawaiians and the general public. But it says it in the law book, but it's not being manifest in our world. So that's what I'd like to say. <laughs> we just keep moving it though, yeah. I think, I think that's, that's an important issue. Thank you, uh, Mahalo uh, for, for, for recognizing the, you know, it's there, but it's not being practiced. It's not being implemented. It's being almost pushed aside for the interests of, of a few. Um, we have uh, a question um, from um, from Marioni and, and a similar question from Oliver that, that I'd like to um, to put through and and I guess this is about the appropriation of knowledge uh, narratives uh, you know we call we talk about uh, cultural appropriation. Um, Marioni asks how can we ensure that our indigenous narratives about guardianship and stewardship does not get captured and used by harmful agendas uh, by Western governments, development partners, mining companies who want to grab ocean resources. And, and Oliver adds really around um, um, an, a question around uh, deep sea mining companies pushing the argument that the deep ocean exists beyond social and cultural realms. And how do we uh, challenge these arguments from Pacific ways of knowing, being, and belonging to the ocean? Uh, Kela, uh, Keloha, you have responded already, I think, or reflected already in your intervention around, uh, you know, that the land, the sea, from the ocean floor to the furthest star in space that we can see. Uh, and is continuing to, to exist is part of that uh, social and cultural indigenous uh, world. Um, Hilda also referred to that. Um, but maybe I start with Colin um, really around the challenge of uh, trying to talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the indigenous narratives and guardianship and stewardship of the ocean when narratives are being captured and used in, in other ways. Would you like to, to maybe respond on that? Thank you, James. You know, we've, all, we've all heard the cliche, the youth are our future. And I think it's, it, in this sense, it's very true. Um, for me, maintaining a strong and, and even building a relationship between you know for our youth with the environment is key because once once our youth uh, lose that important link that relationship with our source of life um, then you know their their wish i guess their their opposition to to some of these demands on uh, on our resource uh, will will move away, and you know, there it's it's about just keeping our our youth interested in furthering what we're all talking about today, and, and uh, that's key. Is, is uh, everything that we do in our everyday lives should be towards guiding our our youth to a, a, a strong desire and love to protect our resource, Naka. Colin. 
Uh, Kealoha, Hilda, would you like to also respond to that question? Hilda? Uh, there is a difference between the uh, indigenous governance and uh, um, modern governance, which um, uh, the, the, the difference is that indigenous governance is governance for all, everything. And uh, when we uh, look at the modern governance, uh, they only uh, talk about uh, a part of something. They don't talk about the holistic and they don't talk about collectivity. Whereas indigenous governance always talks about collectivity in, for example, the ocean, um, the land, there is no one person that owns the land in where, or where I come from. The, the land is owned by a, a totem group and uh, it's not individual, which means that when uh, you try to record this uh, in the uh, Western law, the law only records one part, one part of it, but it's not collective. So uh, I'd like to see that uh, um, if Western law is going to use uh, is going to use indigenous knowledge that they record it properly, but they don't, they don't record it the way they look at it. Uh, it should be recorded uh, properly. Uh, for example. Um, with intellectual property rights of anything. We, the indigenous governance of Vanuatu does not allow anything to be, um, to be legalized according to a Western uh, uh, concept. Uh, and I'll give the example of uh, the indigenous writing which we have, when it came into uh, when it came to reality uh, in 1993, we decided we are not going to register it. It belongs to the people, to the indigenous people, uh, and uh, it's not to be registered in the Western law. The Western law is for uh, for uh, something else and the indigenous law is for people. Everybody is uh, in it. So we decided not to uh, register it, which is the same as um, uh, indigenous governance today has decided to run two uh, parallel systems in Vanuatu. The indigenous system has its own governance and the West, uh, Western system or modern system has its own governance. If we are going to match it, we're going to fight, fight, fight for a long time and we'll never get anything done and everything gets stolen, gets stolen from the indigenous people. So we decided uh, to, to run two separate systems uh, and um, protect what we have in the indigenous uh, governance system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hilda. Ke aloha. Yes. Oops, sorry. I'm not, oh yeah. So sorry. I'm That's so, right, well, there you are. My clicker. <laughs> um, no, what Colin and Hilda said is beautiful. Um, I think it's absolutely true. When we're, when we're thinking, um, we, have a, we have a quote at home, or a, um, I forget what they're called, but it's, it's basically says this, the land is the chief and we are its servant, yeah? So we become subservient to, to, to the needs of the land because, you know, uh, we can't live without the land. The land can live without us, but we can't live without the land or the ocean for that matter, right? Um, and so there is, um, there is a lot of expropriation. 
and abuse. Um, and I think basically we just, when all three branches of in the United States system starts to fail, it really is the rise of the people that will stop the abuse. But it has to come, uh, it, it has to come kind of organically and naturally and be inspired by the, by the land. And so, um, and the other thing I wanted to say is, um, actually, I think I forgot my last point, but main thing, as long as we're, we're going back to the land, staying and conspiring with Papahanaumoku, Earth Mother, Sky Father, you know, I think we're, we're um, we are the children of, of that divine union, you know, and so we keep that going. It's the only way to do it. I, I mean, in my, my opinion. And, you know, when, when, when the companies try to argue that, um, you know, the deep sea is outside of the human realm, you know, we need to ask them and say, well, you're going to profit, aren't you? You know, <laughs> so it's not outside your, th that, that realm, but it's within our creation. And that's where we have to keep upholding the creation for all. Because when we pray, we don't just pray for Hawaiians, we pray for everyone in the world, right? So we have to maintain that position of power and, and, and stop them when they are abusive. We just have to. We, it, it, the expropriation and the misuse and the contamination of what is righteous into something that is unrighteous, we have to continue to just stand, stand up for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think uh, you know that 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 the the necessary or the necessity to for us to regardless of where we come from, when we see the injustice, to be able to stand up and al allow that. I think that's something that has been suppressed quite quite a lot through col colonialism, uh, the the suppression of narratives, uh, not just as a form of colonialism, but uh, systematic uh, systemic racism. Uh, these are key key issues that 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 come up, and so thank you so much to uh, to your responses to the to that particular question, a uh, series of questions from Mariani and um, and Oliver. Um, there's a question for you, Colin, um, and and um, Hilda referred to this in terms of the capturing of in you know indigenous laws um, and uh, and and how you do that respectfully and holistically. Uh, this is really in regards to retaining important traditional knowledge in navigation using modern documentation methods and training. Um, of course, oral tradition is there, but is there a, a respectful way to digitize this, uh, this process? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think for us, um, you know, uh, sustainable sea transport using traditional means um, in the in the modern world needs to be accepted by our uh, I guess our the marine safety authority agencies in the Pacific and so it, it's about merging the traditional knowledge with uh, modern safety practices so that we're basically removing the excuse for them to say no you you can't use that vessel it's not seaworthy and we all know that uh, you know, these vessels are very seaworthy and we've proved that with the long ocean voyages that we've done. So yeah, I think that's, that's the key and that's what we're working on here in Fiji is, uh, is again, you know, for instance, uh, the syllabus training book that we put together for our village canoe program. We basically worked off the world sailing uh, syllabus for teaching how to teaching sailing. And we've um, adapted that and and adopted it for our own traditional canoes. And that's what we're using in the hope that uh, even one day we could include a traditional, traditional design into the Pacific games, rather than using, uh, you know, imported Western style vessels uh, for racing, that we can actually adopt one of our own Pacific designs um, to be used at the Pacific games using these, uh, World, you know, world sailing class rules that we've adopted. Naka. 
Thank you, Menaka Colin. I, I, you know, I, and, and that, I guess, speaks to uh, the issue of how people, or some people, <laughs> don't be generalizing here, but the challenge that we face when uh, those that come from a Western development, uh, only our way of thinking is the right way because we are the innovators, put indigenous knowledge, wisdom, um, you know, uh, put indigenous laws in some kind of glass box and say, this is very good and beautiful and um, really lovely to talk about. And this is a great webinar, but that belongs in the past over there. Uh, it cannot connect to today's world, to the modern world. But what we're talking about is recognizing that indigenous knowledge is innovative because it deals with what's in front of us. It, it, it's dealt with that for thousands of years as we have progressed or as we have moved along in, in, in time. It, it allows us to go back and bring that knowledge and wisdom to the situations we are facing, um, facing today. Now, uh, we have a question from, um, from Margaret uh, talking about uh, or asking her from a perspective of preservation of indigenous wisdom, practice and knowledge systems. Uh, are there models that can be shared for reconciling intergenerational challenges? Because that, that is a big challenge for us. Uh, Colin referred to this, um, uh, Hilda has referred to this. Uh, how do we, how do we, have that intergenerational dialogue so that it's not you know just us over 30 40 year old people and up that are having those conversations um uh another of our uh, audience talked about how do we bring these things back into our our formal and informal education processes but particularly the formal education process colin you referred to that um Maybe Hilda, you would like to, you could respond. How do you bring that? How do you bring this knowledge and make sure that it's passed down to the next generation and that it's recognized as important? All I can say is that in the indigenous system, it is being done to be passed down to the next generation. It depends on who does it? Who is ready to go through the process? Because a lot of us talk about it, but we don't even do it. And uh, the, uh, the, how I would say it is, uh, uh, every time we talk about integrating something, it's always the indigenous integrating into the modern or the Western ways. You, we don't talk about how they can work uh, parallel to each other because they can contribute so much. It's always, always about integrating it into the Western um, context. And uh, um, I don't agree to, to this because I think that is of the past. Today, we, sh we should be talking about how can we have two parallel systems uh, working and two parallel ideas working and two, in two systems working. Um, we should be able to find a, a way how we can make them work, but not talk about getting one into the other because uh, um, uh, indigenous people would not want their system or their ideas or their knowledge to be lost in the Western uh, system. If it's a very important knowledge, it has to be kept and it can only be kept by those who respect it, but not by those who only use it for the purpose of uh, using it, but not respecting it uh, for the role that it has in life. So, um, I would like to uh, say that. Thank you, Hilda. I think that's very important. It, it ties into a, to a question that um, another of our audience have asked uh, about academia as a space to renegotiate the di dichotomy between indigenous and modern systems of governance. Um, Lilietis asks, says, uh, 
Universities are hotspots for young people to gather, learn, and discuss. Is this possible? What potential, if any, does this have? Um, Ke aloha, uh, responding to, to perhaps what Hilda has been sharing and, and this question by, by Lilieta. You know, um, what Tilda just said is, is beautiful. It's exactly that. Like, um, there is this tendency where everyone wants to take our knowledge and conform it so that it fits. Now, in Colin's example, that's a good example, right? Where it can fit. But there's actually a lot of places where it just won't fit. It's possible that the, the West needs to learn how to integrate to our systems um, and, and learn from that rather than, you know, I mean, I was on a Zoom meeting recently where all these people were talking about aquaculture and, and they were considering if they should have a subcommittee for Native Hawaiians to come on. <laughs> It's like Native Hawaiians are invented this form of aquaculture that they're referring to. And, and so we should not be in a subcommittee. We need to be in, in, in the decision making. You know, we're always framed as advisory to all of these groups. And one of the main issues that we have right now in the ocean is that the United States continues to, to speak for us. And we don't want them to speak for us. We can speak for ourselves. And they also don't have the knowledge to, to, to speak to anyways. So um, maybe again, it's one of those things of how we pivot or how we shift and, and, and opening up. But I would also, I agree with what Hilda was uh, saying is that those who respect the knowledge and don't just want to extract things from the knowledge. We need to have systems and ways of um, holding responsibility to the knowledge as well. Um, because uh, it, otherwise it gets profaned. And when it gets profaned, then it gets abused and, and, and then it just becomes some dog and pony show that the Americans want to do, you know? So, sorry, I don't mean to be. <laughs> no, no, that's 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 fine. We we speak from where we are. Right? I mean, that's the importance to acknowledge the the struggles that we we are going through at this time. Yes. Um, and and that's that is so important because um, in our region, in, in in this you know this blue Pacific uh, uh, liquid continent that we we talk about, we're all in various different spaces or or, or uh, struggles for self determination. Even if we are so-called independent, we still have those those struggles, um, and and th there is therein I think is is the challenge. You know, being pragmatic, uh, as one of our um, audience have has mentioned in the chat about how we engage, but also ensuring uh, that you know even the way that knowledge is treated is a matter of justice as well, and this extractive nature that we find in 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 the western development discourse of even extracting that knowledge and taking it and and using it for its own its own gain um we have i think um uh with one of the uh questions that that we have really is that thinking about what has been shared today um our indigenous knowledge and wisdom and, and practices, our custom law, how then do we approach the issues of um, sourcing material that people say we need? Is that possible? And what, what would be the way in which we, we address this? Because that perhaps is a a point of how we engage with 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 some of our governments. Uh, some are very extractive in nature. Some feel pressured to engage in extractive industries uh, because of uh, what they see as as economic necessities. But how do we approach that? What is our our place? What is your place as guardians, um, you know, uh, of our Pacific? How do we approach that? Um, that space of okay, there is something that is needed, 
or where, whether it is needed or not, perhaps is the question. Colin. Uh, perhaps I can just start by just saying, probably the, the best way that we can approach this is just by being united, you know, indigenous cultures across the Pacific, you know, leaving aside our, our political uh, determination in our own countries, by just being united and working together, we can have a much louder voice. We can, we can all pull together and, uh, and fight this together rather than on our own in our own countries. I'd just like to say that, Naka. Naka Colin. Uh, Hilda, Kealoha. Sorry, could you repeat the question again? Sure. This, um, the, the question that was asked, um, let me just pull it quickly back up again. Um, what, uh, well, uh, this is the, the way that uh, the question has been asked. What can indigenous governments, governance systems tell us about how to res relationally, respectfully and ethically and wisely approach sourcing of materials like minerals that we need for so many things. How do we, how do we then approach these, this issue of, of extraction? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say, who needs this extraction? It's not the people of the Pacific, it's not indigenous people. It's the, extra, extra, um, it's the industries that need it. So uh, we should see what is uh, what needs to be extracted that is going to help everyone, and it's not going to uh, destroy the, the the ocean or the environment. Um, a lot of these things are extracted because they are needed by businesses, and. We don't really need it. We, as indigenous people, we live to look after what is going to going to be a, to be available to everyone. What is ours? But we don't we don't uh, live for uh, individual businesses unless we allow ourselves to be used. By, indi uh, by individual businesses. Thank you, Hilda. Kealoha? Yeah, uh, you know, when the argument on the mountain um, often goes, like I said earlier, you know, Hawaiians, Look, treating us like, and actually the lawyers actually called us that, we were backward looking extremists, right? But um, the indigenous, the global indigenous movements are forward looking. You know, people always say, oh, you wanna go back to the grass shack, Kaloha. No, I wanna go forward to that, <laughs> forward to a better way of living. I mean, what, what we're facing is, the commodification of the entire earth um, and absolute no concept of the collective, the good of the collective, the ocean controlled by uh, uh, no one. No, it should be controlled by everyone collectively. It's just that we're afraid to, to try to build consensus oftentimes because um, they, they try to divide and conquer everywhere, right? So, but, but the Pacific people can actually build consensus and build alternatives. See, we're, we're so used to fighting, we never get to the alternative. There are, are alternatives to all of these kinds of industries uh, that we could offer as alternatives, right? But the, the, the extractive model of, of the West has, has to come to an end because it is not contributing to the collective greater good of all people on earth. 
if 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 we destroy these sources, our sources, we destroy everything. And so I, you know, these these single industries trying to profit, they love to, you know, put it on us, shift the burden. No, the burden's on you to show us how this benefits the world, rather than us having to go to court and suing them on uh, environmental law or this, that, or the other thing, we need to start shifting it and turning it around and saying, no, you have the burden to prove that you intend to help the world. Not just, I mean, because we can see your profit margin. That's prof We know who that's profiting, but where is it helping the world heal and become abundant? That's, I think that's a, a one way to flip it, you know? Flip it back on them. They're making us do all the work. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's that flip from, you know, what we call, in, you know, mitigating environment degradation to putting the environment, putting our, our, the ecosystem that we are all a part of at the forefront of what we do. So thank you so much. Uh, friends, uh, we are coming towards the end of our, um, our oh. webinar today. Uh, but before I uh, say words of thanks, I would like to give this opportunity um, to, uh, to um, Hilda, to Kealoha, to Colin, to maybe share some uh, closing reflections um, based on, on uh, what we have discussed today. Uh, I'm sure there's still much, much more still there, the depth of, of knowledge and wisdom and experience from our three speakers. But uh, um, you know, this is an opportunity for, for you to share um, any, any closing remarks. I'll begin with Hilda. Thank you, James. Um, I would like to uh, pick up on what uh, Colin Phillips said about getting the ideas from the Pacific together. We, we are not able to get together physically, but under this series, if we, are, if we are really serious about finding a way of uh, how we can, uh, um, we can move into the future, we could make one of these series uh, uh, looking at the, how we, we get the Pacific uh, indigenous people to put together ideas uh, of how we can work together. I think that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, um, Hilda, for that. Ke aloha. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, here. Um, exactly. I think that's why I was honored to participate here with the collective, the Pacific groups coming together. And honestly, I'm going to say this, and I, I mean it from my heart. There's absolutely no reason why we can't um, create our own ocean treaty or our sign treaties between the indigenous people for a solid goal. You know, we get locked into, it needs to be UN structured or this structured. How about Pacific structure? We can look at that and, and come up with those ideas. And I, we just have to roll up our sleeves and do the work. And I, and I think people in the world need that because we're, we're fighting things, but, but what we're needing are solutions. So we need to set a, a big part of our time aside for those solutions. Otherwise, we're just in a constant cycle of fight, you know, fighting for our rights. How about just let's start articulating what those are. Um, in a Pacific way, uh, the Moana Nui way, um, because we have been um, colonized real, very thoroughly. And this is part of our decolonization also, just standing up for, for what we know. Like here's just a simple example. We are often referred to as small island nations. I think we wanna start being called large ocean nations. You know, just that shift in perspective. No, we're big ocean nations. 
that's who we are. You know what I'm, th this is what I mean. Like these, these small changes make big difference in our thinking and, and the way we, we will want to move in the world. Um, Cause we can't just keep waiting for the West to try to fix it. Cause it, they don't get to fix what they just dis are destroying. You know what I mean? So we need to become that, that alternative that we're seeking. Absolutely, absolutely. We have to reclaim that narrative and change that story and change that narrative. Um, Colin, over to you. Thank you, James. I just, firstly, I just wanted to say how honored I am to be presenting alongside these uh, incredible women, Kia Loa and Hilda. I think uh, Pacific Structured is a great way to move forward, uh, Kia Loa. I, I just wanted to conclude by saying that, the, you know, the ocean is what connects us all and it is the very center of who we are. And for me, the, the passing on of traditional knowledge to the next generation is what will empower and equip them to navigate us into the future. And I think that that's really our, uh, the secret to the future is um, empowering our youth, Naka. Thank you, Colin, Vinaka. These conversations, these uh, sharing and questions, the thoughts, the reflections that have taken place this afternoon are part of just some of the strands of the very important net or mat or basket that we need to weave to protect our Pacific home and through protecting our Pacific home, protect the planet. And so my deep, deep appreciation to uh, Hilda Lini, to uh, Kealoha Piscotta, and uh, Colin, Phil, for, for your presentations. You have blessed us today with your sharing, with your passion, your knowledge, your, your deep wisdom and insight into the conversations today. Uh, our, also our appreciation to our uh, participants who have joined us. Um, uh, through the webinar and online on social media. And uh, we'd like to acknowledge uh, those partners that uh, work together to put this Pacific Blue Line webinar series together, the Pacific Blue Line Collective of, uh, of Dawn, Piango, PCC, uh, WWF uh, Pacific, Pang and Toucan, and all those that continue to support uh, the many, many people who work in this space, whether they are part of webinars or not, uh, our indigenous communities who are uh, fighting to not just survive, but to thrive. So thank you so much to all of you for, for participating, for being part of this community and bringing your stories from, or the stories of your communities, the different communities that uh, of which you are a part, the different pieces of of land and sea and sky, which you uh, embrace and form this beautiful world in which we live in. Thank you so much. And you know, from the Pacific Conference of Churches, if, uh, where I come from, it has been a, an, an absolute pleasure to, to join with you as a fellow uh, person who contributes the strands that we can bring from our theological and uh, philosophical perspectives into this conversation. Uh, so until the next webinar, uh, God bless you all and continue to weave, to challenge the narrative, to change the story, and to live and practice what we speak about. Naka, God bless you all. Naka. <laughs>